انت ميوت يا ياسر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, welcome in this new Ramadan meeting of ESNT which is supposed to be the last meeting in this holy month uh, in the start I would like to welcome uh, Professor Muhammad Gunaymat uh, the uh, head of Jordan Society of Mythology and Transplantation and the president elect of Misot who is in, in his second home, ESNT, one of the activities of ESNT today, and we are honored to have him today with us. Thank you Shukran. very much, and welcome, Shukran. Professor Gunaymat. Thank you. Shukran jazeelan. Uh, proteinuria, a traditional marker of kidney disease, which we use to speak about as a disease by itself and a marker even for classification and diagnosis of kidney disease. We only also used to treat it with the uh, RAS blockers as the main uh, item for treatment of this disease. In the last three uh, to four years, uh, we have many and many drugs emerged targeting proteinuria, both in diabetic nephropathy and in non-diabetic kidney disease. I would like really to thank Professor Tar el as uh, when I talked to him about the, this topic, he welcomed it most and decided to include it in the activities of the clinical nephrology and the CKD chapter of ESNT. Moreover, he agreed to take over the topic by himself. And thank you, Professor Tarek. Thank you. Uh, we are honored today to have uh, Professor Maya Hasaballah as the moderator together with Professor Gunaymat for this meeting, president of ESNT. And before I leave the floor to Professor Maya to welcome our guests, I would like to welcome all attendees who are with us and starting to join successively this meeting and all the professors who are starting to join uh, that we will have inshallah a very rich heavy discussion after the lecture uh, please professor may the floor is yours is yours and professor when i meant to introduce professor Tari and take it off thank, thank you yes thank you very much uh, i'd like to welcome you all and i really am very proud to be sharing this meeting uh, with uh, co-moderating with Professor Mohamed Ghanaymet. Uh, of course, you all know him. He is uh, president of the Jordan Society of Nephrology and past president of the Arab Society of Nephrology and president-elect of the Mizut. But away from science, uh, Professor Ghanaymet is a great, a man of great virtues. He is most generous, most giving and most humble and most sincere and uh, I, it will take me a long list to talk about but also he is in love with Egypt and whenever we ask him to come and join our conferences he never lets us down and he is and will always be in our hearts so thank you very much professor when I met for joining as usual and of course uh, the speaker today is uh, I'm proud to be with Professor uh, Tari el uh, Again, Professor Tari is a uh, past, immediate past president of the Arab Society of Nephrology and past president of the Egyptian Society of Nephrology. And he is so much into uh, CNE and especially ESMT CNE. And it's not just because he has more than 50 uh, lectures already in, in the library, but for those who don't know, it all started with Professor Tari Elbaz and Professor Hussein Shahisha, rahimahullah, uh, during Professor Tariq's presidency. So thank you very much, Professor Tariq, for, for this very interesting subject. And the subject is really, uh, it's very important, actually. It is uh, the concern of every nephrologist how to retard progression of CKD and how not to reach patients reach to end stage renal disease with dialysis and transplantation. And of course, you all know that proteinuria is uh, deleterious to the kidney in the long run. And in spite of using other drugs that are known to reduce proteinuria, we still mm. uh, don't get to target and we still have patients continuing and reaching end stage renal disease. So uh, I hope Professor Tariq will shed light on new weapons against an old disease, proteinuria. Father. Professor Gunaymat, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Ghali and my friend, Dr. May Khadjaltini, 
بهذا الاطراء اللي ارجو الله تعالى ان اكون استحقته شرف كبير لي اني اكون مع كل يوم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلاه وسلام على رسول الله واسعد الله مساءكم بكل خير رمضان كريم تقبل الله طاعتكم ولاخواني الاقباط نكست سندي ايستر كل عام وهم بالف خير الحقيقة أن هذا المنتدى العلمي العظيم يعني يشرفني أن أكون معكم اليوم في هذا المساء فيه وأترحم أضم صوتي للدكتورة مي في أن أترحم على أخي وصديقي وحبيبي رحمة الله عليه الأستاذ الدكتور حسين الشعيشة واللي كان له دور كبير في تأسيس وديمومة هذا المنتدى العظيم فشكرا جزيلا دكتوره مي شكرا لاخي الدكتور ياسر على الدعوه الكريمه محاضرنا اليوم غني عن التعريف كثير صعب اني احكي عنه اعتقد انه من 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 اصعب ومن اسهل الاشياء اني اقدم الدكتور طارق الباس من اسهلها بيكوز اي نو ايفريثينج اباوت هيم اي لاف ايفريثينج اباوت هيم ودائما نستفيد من علمه ونتعلم منه كلا ونتعلم منه إثكس ونتعلم منه أخلاق ونتعلم منه كثير شغلات ومن أصعب الأشياء أني أقدم الدكتور طارق لأنه whatever I say about him بكون مقصر دائما مقصر دائما بستحق أني أحكي عنه إشي أكثر فشرف كبير أنه اليوم تتاح إلي الفرصة في تقديم أستاذي وأخي وحبيبي ورفيق دربي الاستاذ الدكتور طارق الباز دكتور طارق تفضل بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لساني يعجز عن الرد على الكلام الجميل اللي سمعته such flattering words i'm happy tonight it's one of my happiest nights in ramadan being with my friends really i'm overwhelmed with joy and uh, since a long time i haven't been addressing clinical uh, nephrology And I'm happy tonight. And, and thank you, Professor Diaz, for giving me this wonderful chance to address this point. I appreciate your time, Professor Van I appreciate your time and accepting the invitation, Professor Mai. Uh, surely this is going to uh, give uh, this talk uh, a lot of wealth because I know both of you and the other professors, I don't see the names now that would like to share in the discussion. And to save time, let me start by showing you what I'm going to address today, starting by some pathophysiological consideration. Of course, I can talk for an hour about this point, but just a few slides, then I'll pass on to standards of care therapies and end up by what uh, I have to offer regarding new drugs, or let me say all drugs, with new modes of action as well. Just as a reminder uh, about uh, proteinuria, uh, we have three different pathways of three different forms of proteinuria, glomerular dysfunction leading to glomerular proteinuria or cases of tuberous tissue disease or overflow proteinuria with cases of paraproteinuria. Thanks to the ultrastructure of uh, the, the capillaries of uh, the Bowman's capsule, as you can see, and those glycocalyx that coat the pores of the endothelial cells that are always repelling large molecules, particularly albumin. Then we have the well hydrated three layers of the basic membrane, another obstacle, and if eventually the slit pores and the slit diaphragms and all of which is related to uh, podocin and nephrin and various molecules that give this wonderful structure is in its integrity. Once there is disruption of this integral uh, system, of course, we have a state of proteinuria. Uh, proteinuria, as you can see here, measured or assessed by dipsticks is only valid for glomerular form of proteinuria, which is mainly album, while tubular proteins, or let me say uh, light chain proteins, we, uh, we cannot detect it by uh, dipsticks, but rather by other uh, things. 
Uh, this diagram, just to show you what is happening when we have a renal injury uh, leading to a glomerular capillary uh, pressure increase, this is uh, continuously bombarding this ultrastructure of the capillaries and would eventually lead to a podocyte dysfunction. Uh, with this podocyte dysfunction, permeability increases and the macromolecules, mainly album, starts to pass into the urine to filtrate. And by time, tubules, as we know, the proximal part of the tubules are responsible about re reabsorbing this album and then catabolizing it to be used once more. When this process is more than what the tubules can achieve, a state of inflammation starts to happen in these renal tubules that start to go into apoptosis and maybe also secrete various inflammatory mediators, among which uh, TNF-alpha, leading to accumulation of the interstitium by the extracellular matrix. You all know the description in diabetic nephropathy, eventually leading to scarring and GFR, and that's how CKD process. Uh, pro, uh, progresses, particularly in diabetic nephropathy, which is just one entity of diabetic kidney disease. For a long time, and maybe Professor May just mentioned, uh, controlling the blood pressure is important to reduce the albumin. And for many years now, we have been using RAS blockers. But unfortunately, we have a substantial portion of patients that are quite resistant to this anti proteinuric effects of the RAS for various re reasons. I have to uh, mention that salt restriction is of prime importance. Also, the well-known escape phenomena related to aldosterone release is another factor hindering this anti proteinuric effect. Not to mention what has been mentioned earlier related to uh, genetic po polymorphism in the angiotensin gene where the DD allele is known to be poorly responsive to uh, blocking by the RAS blockers, as well as these type of patients are more vulnerable to cardiovascular morbidities. So eventually these patients will end up with a residual albuminuria, hence it is wise to combine other therapies uh, together with RAS blockers as I will come to show you. And this takes me directly to the standard of care therapies that we have been using. And before going into details, I'd like to do, remind you that all the trials suggested a multidisciplinary approach focusing on optimizing the metabolic status, particular hyperglycemia, as well as control of the blood pressure before or together with adding whatever therapies you are going to use. So the standards of care therapies, as you can see underlined here, are rust blockers, CCBs, and diuretics. For a long time, we've been using the rust blockers and we understand that angiotensin II, which we are aiming at blocking its action, together with aldosterone, are the key players in the development of renal failure due to promoting tissue fibrosis, as well as the intra-renal hemodynamics. Therefore, it is quite wise to use RAS blockers in order to prevent the progression of proteinuria and eventually chronic kidney disease. Uh, as a reminder, you can see the untreated patient with both vasoconstriction of the efferent and efferent arterioles. And once you are using ACEs or uh, ARBs, you find a good effect related to vasodilatation of the efferent arteriole, which would reflect on a drop in the intraglomerular pressure, helping in decreasing proteinuria and progression of CKD. Uh, looking at this diagram, you would realize what is happening when you are blocking uh, this pathway. It is resulting in uh, preventing the unwanted actions of angiotensin II when it binds to its T1 receptors such as vasoconstriction and the aldosterone release and the renal sodium resorption. So this is how ACE uh, or ARBs work as a matter of fact, leaving the angiotensin II 
to, to give its beneficial effects when it is attached to the T2 receptors leading to vasodilatation and inhibition of uh, cellular growth and apoptosis. Not only that, the RAS blockers are not only working at a hemodynamic level, but also uh, wonderfully, they are able to decrease oxidative stress, inflammation, fibrosis, and apoptosis, and also enhance the production of nitric oxide, which is definitely needed for the integrity of the endothelial lining of these delicate blood vessels, as well as maintaining their vasodilatation. So this is how rust blockers are helpful. Also, since a long time, we have come to learn that combining both types of drugs, whether the uh, ACE inhibitors or the ARBs is not recommended at all for fear of uh, adverse side effects, mainly hyperkalemia and sometimes hypotension and ATI. So it is not advised at all to combine both drugs together according to various trials addressing this particular point. Uh, if I take uh, the process further up to the father of the angiotensin, which is renin, we have the LS cream, uh, which uh, acts as an anti-renin uh, drug. And uh, since a long time ago, uh, Aliscrin was also shown to be very beneficial in reducing proteinuria, even when compared with 10 milligrams of prindopril, as you can see, uh, it was significantly much better in reducing it up to 36% versus the 10 milligrams of prindopril. So here you have another weapon related to the uh, RAS system that you may uh, like to use, although this particular dart has some unwanted side effects that we have learned over uh, the years. Just an important note related to salt intake, which is something the doctor can't do, but he just has to enforce this knowledge and empower the patient to understand and realize that it is of utmost importance to restrict salt to get the benefits of RAS blockers. Without salt restriction, it's very difficult to achieve what you really uh, get out of using ACE inhibition or ARBs. And this high salt intake could also uh, make proteinuria worse. So uh, never forget this uh, particular point. I come to another point related to uh, restriction of protein intake. And there's a lot of deba debate regarding this particular point. But I have to say that in the early stages of CKD with proteinuria or without, restricting the protein doesn't have much value except when the patient reaches stage 3A to 3B. Uh, at this point, you are advised to ask the patient to restrict uh, the uh, high biological value uh, proteins, but not earlier. Moving on to the CCBs, and the CCBs, we all understand they are of two types, whether the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers or the, the high dihydropyridine uh, ones, which are actually more potent in controlling blood pressure, by the way, such as amlodipine and philodipine and nicardipine and so forth. These are much better uh, because they offer more uh, degree of preferred vasodilatation, lowering the blood pressure. But when it comes to the kidney, I will show you uh, some important differences. Uh, CCBs could offer renal protection, but this is only apparent with the non dehydropyridine forms. Uh, and this is not happening only due to uh, hemodynamic effects related to dilatation of the efferent arteriole, but also they have the, capa the capacity to reduce the glomerular per permeability and prevent mesangial matrix expansion. Uh, the reduction in proteinuria seen with the non dehydropyridine calcium channel blockers, as I said, is not seen with other forms of CCBs that may also have various adverse events, as you can see listed uh, in the slide. An important point I should not overlook is related to how these CCBs are working. The non the hydropyridine are working at a level of a specific calcium channel known as the T-type, while the dehydropyridine ones are working 
at another uh, calcium channel level called the L-type. Now, for some time, we understand that the T-type form of calcium channels are very important and, uh, and working at this level is uh, or blocking these particular calcium channels is how the non dehydropyridine derivatives uh, affect uh, the kidneys in positive ways in, uh, and decreasing the, the glomerular hyperfiltration and uh, leading to dilatation of uh, the efferent arteriole as well as the afferent arteriole. While if you are using the other forms, the dihydropyridine ones, you will be left with a vasoconstriction of the efferent arteriole with an increase in the glomerular pressure, intraglomerular pressure, which would even worsen proteinuria. So this point is very important when you are treating proteinuria, your choice for a CCD should depend on this piece of information. Diuretics, I came across this recent publication and I found it very interesting that although diuretics are used widely by us nephrologists, yet not all of us uh, realize that they have some antiproteinuric properties uh, as well. And looking at thiazide diuretics in particular, coupled with the low salt diet, uh, they were able in various studies to, to reduce proteinuria by up to 35%. Also, thiazide like diuretics like indepamide and chlorothalidone have uh, similar effects. No wonder that these uh, diuretics are combined nowadays uh, in one pill with either uh, ACE inhibitors or RAS blockers to achieve a potentiation of the anti proteinuric effect of RAS blockers. And this is a list of various, only just some studies related to combining uh, ACEs and ARBs with thiazide diuretics. And all of these trials or studies that I'm showing in this slide have showed very positive effects related to more potentiation of the anti proteinuric effect of whether, uh, as you can see here, uh, for example, uh, Lozartan or uh, Inalapril, all of this, when you add uh, a small dose of hydrochlorothiazide, you get more and more uh, significant reduction in proteinuria. Uh, this is also valid, by the way, for loop diuretics. And these studies looked into the issue of adding a loop diuretic, which we are inclined sometimes to use in cases of associated edema, which is not uncommon in our proteinuric patients, particularly uh, the diabetics. Uh, we don't have any sharp evidence that cyzides or loop diuretics are capable of blowing proteinuria on their own, but rather it is due their, to their uh, hemodynamic effects in uh, decreasing the interglomerular pressure, which is also dependent so much once more on uh, asking the patient to decrease his dietary salt intake. What I want to say that uh, the exact antiproteinuric effects of thiazides, as I have mentioned, has not been really elucidated. And it is due to the reduction only of the intraglomerular pressure. And I have to caution you when using diuretics uh, in this regard uh, that uh, a patient who is on RAS blockers and using a diuretic, uh, if you are not uh, uh, regularly following him up, it may end up into an acute kidney injury. But this doesn't mean that we don't use a diuretic. We just have to be aware of this possible uh, complication that could happen. Uh, moving to the last part of my talk related to the new drugs and looking at new drugs, I have classified them into old drugs with newer understood mechanisms and the actual new drugs that are uh, uh, present now and we are using to treat proteinuria and even some of them out of the scope of diabetic kidney disease or diabetic nephropathy and have been tried in CPD at large, which is something very, very exciting. Uh, let me start by the DPP-4 inhibitors or the incretins. And just one slide, I want to don't want to flood you with a lot of studies related to uh, 
just skin cretin. Uh, these drugs do not cause uh, commonly hypoglycemia, which is something very good. And they don't only show glucose lowering properties, but also they are capable of uh, giving us some neuroprotective neuro, uh, functions. And looking at this particular part of this big diagram, you can find this is achievable by increasing naturesis, decreasing uh, the interglomerular pressure, resulting in better GFR, and decreasing the renal inflammatory processes that are uh, happening uh, in relation to hyperglycemia and oxidative stress. And there's a lot of trials I'm not going to show today related to this point, but DPP-4 have not been tried in CKD generally, only in diabetic kidney disease associated with proteinuria and CKD. Now, I want to talk about my favorite drug, metformin, which I call the drug with many faces, just like Johnny Depp who was able to uh, present to us all of these characters. Uh, in the same way, metformin is a drug with various pleiotropic effects, as you can see listed here. And for tonight, I'm just uh, focusing on its nephroprotective actions in diabetes. And now I'm glad to say in CKD, in non-diabetic patients as well, there are various trials uh, that have proven that using uh, metformin and CKD has nephroprotective actions. And this is just, I picked two, just two titles to show you, uh, two titles of many related to how metformin is important in this context, uh, treating or preventing the progression of chronic kidney disease and proteinuria, uh, since we are talking about proteinuria tonight. Why is this happening? The pleiotropic effects, why is it happening? because there is a certain mechanism behind these actions. It wasn't understood that well before, and uh, now it is, has been uh, revealed, and maybe other mechanisms also are following, uh, giving more wealth to this drug uh, that we are becoming to be so much excited about that we are treating uh, aging, since we have discovered that metformin uh, does remarkable actions in, in particular uh, points related to being anti-senescent. Uh, but keeping to what I'm talking about tonight, uh, metformin and proteinuria, uh, this diagram simplifies the matter, showing that it increases the activity of the activated mitogenic protein kinase, which is something uh, very important when it is active. It depresses or down-regulates the uh, mammalian target of rapamycin, which is responsible uh, when uh, secreted in excess to renal cell damage. No, no, not only this, but this is also associated with increasing the fibrosis and the proximal tubular apoptosis and uh, the autophagy inhibition that is happening is prevented. Thus, the cells that are damaged are able to clear themselves once more. Another recent publication, uh, maybe the diagram is very uh, difficult if I'm going to go through all of these factors. I just put it since it is a recent publication, uh, again, underlining the effects of metformin related to uh, activated mitogenic protein kinase and how this action is behind the wonderful and pleiotropic actions of metformin. Even more to your interest, this very recent uh, publication uh, last year showed yet another pathway related to how metformin is reducing proteinuria. And this was an animal experiment in mice where metformin was proven to increase the VGF alpha production in rat kidneys and then the uh, podocytes. Uh, and uh, probably this is related to activating the HIF2 alpha VGF signaling pathway. And this recent pathway, I didn't want to go through into details, but yet I just wanted to share with you that this is another yet described mechanism related to the beneficial effects of metformin in reducing uh, proteinuria 
in renal patients, whether a diabetic kidney disease or CKD at large. Taking you to another drug, which is an old drug, we're not talking about so much, I don't know why, but I will show you that we will be talking about it a lot and we will be using it uh, a lot in the future. Uh, since a long time, since this study, uh, it was a meta-analysis as a matter of fact that addressed 10 studies, including a total of around 470 uh, patients. All of them were diabetics. And all of these 10 studies uh, eventually so showed that pent uh, pentoxifelin significantly decreased uh, proteinuria. And when they, the pent pentoxifelin was compared with captopril, it was found to be quite similar in its effect related to decreasing proteinuria in diabetic patients. Following that meta-analysis, Another trial was published in the year 2015 called the pre diane trial. And looking at the results, you would find excellent uh, rates of reduction of proteinuria, which was highly significant. Not only this, there was also very positive effect related to retarding the decline in GFR in the treated uh, diabetic patients. So here you have another evidence related to the beneficial effects of pentoxifelin. Uh, another uh, trial in the year 2017 showed that combining pentoxifelin with ACEs or ARVs also had an uh, additive effect in reducing the urinary protein excretion compared to either drug alone. So you have here evidence of safety and benefits related to combining both uh, group, uh, both types of drugs uh, together. The problem is that we will have a pill burden uh, by the end of the day if we are going to use everything uh, together. So we have to be choosy. Um, another trial I find is another very interesting point related to pentoxifelin. Unfortunately, it's going to take a very long time. It has been launched last year. And the study aims to enroll 2,500 patients over a four-year period with an additional up to five-year period follow-up. This is really long and surely, surely the results will be significant. So nine years from now, uh, let's hope to be around to see the results of this uh, trial that will really document the beneficial effects of pentoxifelin. And now, not just in diabetics, but in patients with uh, uh, CKD uh, as well, not just diabetic kidney disease. Uh, another old drug yet has been shown to be very beneficial lately in various recent trials with recent forms of MRAs. And let me just start by reminding you how uh, MRAs are beneficial Cardiologists have been using it since a very long time for cardiac remodeling. And we understand that once our patients have the escape phenomena, uh, uh, when they are treated with rough blockers, we have a tendency for the hypertension to be out of control and the continuity of glomerular injury is going on, as well as uh, various uh, actions related to aldosterone in, uh, in other parts of the body. Uh, this is not uh, my scope of talk today, but rather to show you a little bit in detail what the MRI A's are doing in the kidneys uh, related to decreasing fibrosis and mesangial cellular expansion, and even the podocytopathy, which is a very important part related to proteinuria, and also uh, MRAs uh, would enhance uh, the excessive production of nitric oxide, maintaining the integrity of the capillaries, as well as the endothelial lining uh, of the capillaries. So it seems that uh, MRAs are so beneficial. And again, since long time, uh, this trial showed five randomized placebo control trials. Six trials included patients with non-diabetic CKD, uh, and other trials were directed towards diabetic kidney disease patients. And in conclusion, uh, to cut it short, uh, patients with CKD with persistent proteinuria, despite 
RAS inhibition, it was found that the addition of MRAs uh, was quite promising as a treatment strategy to reduce the blood pressure and proteinuria. And this is very important because most of these patients that start to be resistant to RAS blockers uh, suffer from uh, the aldosterone escape uh, phenomenon. So uh, the aldosterone breakthrough phenomena is really deleterious because a lot of aldosterone that is not supposed to be there is back uh, and uh, actively working, causing its damage to the kidney as I showed you. And uh, the levels of uh, aldosterone in such patients using rust blockers can really increase and this would attenuate the renew protective effects of ACEs and ARBs. Surely you are all aware of the Fidelio trial. I'm not going to go through the details of the trial that I have enlisted here, but rather jump to the pooled analysis to show how using fenineron in the Fidelio trial gave us excellent results related to decreasing cardiovascular death myocardial strokes hospitalization and even time to kidney failure with a sustained more than 57% decrease in GFR. All of these uh, very wonderful uh, results together with the drug that has been shown not to cause that much hyperkalemia has put this drug in a, in a well-seated uh, place now and has been really respected for this trial uh, by the FDA. You would like to know, can we combine this drug with SGL2 inhibitors or not? Only a 5% of the patients uh, addressed in both trials, the Fidelio and the Figaro trial that were uh, testing fenoneurone, uh, were already on SGL2 inhibitors as a standard of care therapy, as well as ACE inhibitors. So we cannot draw conclusions. But further on during this year, a uh, big trial is going to be launched uh, that will address 800 patients uh, with diabetic kidney disease and non-diabetic kidney disease to see if given uh, SGL2 inhibitors plus placebo compared to uh, fenoneurone plus placebo uh, and comparing these two groups to the third group where patients would receive both drugs together. Uh, it is going to uh, start, this, uh, this trial is still going to start in the year 2022. I'm not sure how long it's going to take, but it would answer a good question about can we combine them together or not. There is no fear of extra uh, uh, caution related to hyperkalemia if we are uh, using both drugs together, but just to have a strong uh, evidence of using them together, such a, a, such a trial is needed. A yet newer trial related to MRAs has also been published apart from the magnificent trial uh, related to epilimone. And here, a potassium uh, can urinate uh, more than 50 milligrams per day or even the good old spironolactone and its predecessor, uh, the epilimone, were used. And this trial confirmed that in various CKD subgroups, not only diabetics, but even those without diabetes, uh, there was uh, beneficial effects in retardation of proteinuria. So you can see more and more evidence related to uh, MRA uh, use, and these drugs are becoming more and more uh, favorable as long as you are watching uh, which, uh, for hyperkalemia, which is uh, quite quantifiable and you can really assess and be sure uh, when to stop or when to continue. Vitamin D, for a long time, we've been understanding now that vitamin D is involved in various metabolic pathways and related to various disease areas. And coming to our kidney, we find that vitamin D also is being shown to suppress the renal angiotensis in aldosterone system, as well as having a vasculoprotective action and various anti-inflammatory effects. So it seems that vitamin D also could be helpful in uh, uh, achieving renal protection, maybe together with other drugs as well. 
And this old trial showed that there was a reduction in proteinuria of around 20% in type 2 diabetics who received two micrograms daily of paricalcitol uh, that showed uh, safe reduction of albuminuria in such patients. This was in the year 2010. And why is this happening? This is happening in relation to uh, improving the integrity of the podocytes. The podocytes were discovered to be able to sensitize calcitriol for their own use. And they express both the one alpha hydroxylase as well as the vitamin D receptor. That's why vitamin D has a place or a ligand in the podocytes where it acts. And this recent trial or a recent trial, yes, showed that the vitamin D receptor activation reduced proteinuria in states of hyperglycemia by improving the podocyte integrity, particularly through regulating the WEN system, which is also a very important pathway in the occurrence of hypertension. So much for vitamin D. Just one more publication that I found interesting was the authors of this work that proved that using vitamin D together with hydroxychloroquine when they were treating the lupus patients had a more favorable action related to decreasing proteinuria in systemic lupus erythematosus patients. Now you are all waiting for the SGL2 inhibitors, which is the new comer. Uh, let me say in nephrology, as much as in cardiology, uh, we understand that patients with type two diabetes are uh, passing a lot of sugar in their urine and being reabsorbed uh, by the uh, SGL2 uh, receptor. And uh, a lot of uh, sugar is reabsorbed in this way. And when you are giving the patient the inhibitor, this prevents this excessive absorption uh, and a lot of glucose is wasted in the urine and we have a state of glucosuria. There was a lot of worries related to this glucosuria when the, this, when the drug was first released uh, more than 11 years ago. And now we understand that these complications are really uh, minimal. And you can see that the beneficial effects are related to a part which is related to hemodynamics. The SGL2 inhibitors also promote or lead to afferent as well as efferent arterial vasodilatation resulting in a wonderful intraglomerular pressure decline, helping to retard the progression of CKD as well as decreased proteinuria. I put the slide always to just as a reminder that the CKD progression is dependent on these main three channels, the hemodynamic pathway, the metabolic pathway, and the inflammatory pathway. And the more you have a drug that is capable of working at these uh, three uh, channels, uh, the more benefits you will get. And this is one example of such a drug, which is the SG2 uh, inhibitor, and you can see clearly and easily described in this uh, diagram how SGL2 inhibitors no, do not only affect the hemodynamics of the glomerulus, but they also decrease the oxidative stress as well as the ex, uh, extracellular matrix and definitely have a wonderful effect related to being anti-inflammatory in its actions, uh, decreasing the levels of the adhesion molecules and so forth, and all of which would reflect on uh, attaining a state of uh, lesser glomerular injury and sclerosis, and also a decrease in albuminuria. And the good news, of course, from the recent trials, whether the Credence trial or the DAPA CKD trial, that these drugs can also be used in non diabetic CKD. And this has been uh, released and, and documented in various guidelines uh, today. And we are uh, not, I don't want to say obliged, but we have all the right now to use these drugs safely in CKD patients, apart from diabetics, uh, whether proteinuric or not, and even up to a GFR of uh, 25, and some are even working with it uh, to lesser degrees than 25 ml per minute. Uh, another recent publication is the Emperor 
uh, emperor trial or the emperor kidney trial related to emperor gliflozin. And again, uh, wonderful results were achieved uh, in relation to beneficial effects related to decreasing the proteinuria and prevention of progression of CKD and uh, various uh, endpoints that were addressed. And the study was terminated early because they achieved uh, their targets. And this is another wonderful uh, uh, trial uh, that gives us confidence related to this particular uh, drug uh, together with the DAPA uh, gliflozin. We have the EMPA gliflozin now to be used in the same uh, manner. I came across this publication. I don't know if you find it interesting or not, but it's worth saying. Uh, some patients who have focus segmented glomerular sclerosis of the idiopathic form were found to be having this particular form of glomerulopathy due to a particular genetic uh, aberration or uh, that is happening in the uh, apolipoprotein 1 gene. And such patients having uh, one of two forms of this uh, genetic uh, disease have been identified as kidney risk uh, patients and they develop terrible proteinuria. Now, the good news for this particular type of disease of, of particular type of proteinuria, a new drug which is called oral vx 147 is being tested in this uh, subtype of uh, FSGS patients uh, having this genetic uh, mutation in the uh, apolipoprotein 1 gene. And so far, this work showed the reduction in the urine protein by up to 47%, which is rather uh, very high. And this is very good. The patient started with the urine protein, uh, protein uh, creatinine ratio of 2.2 to end with 1.27, which is a very highly significant result. The last drug I'm addressing today is the other part of the intretin the GLP-1 agonist, and we have the luraglutide and the once weekly uh, subcutaneously given uh, the long-acting semaglutide and the dulaglutide. And these remarkable drugs have uh, really lately shown to be uh, of benefit, particularly in treating uh, obesity. And now they are recommended to be uh, used and to treat uh, obesity uh, a part of diabetes whatsoever. Uh, this is very good. As much as they are of benefits in obesity, also recent trials showed their benefits related to decreasing proteinuria and uh, uh, progression of chronic kidney disease, but they have not been tested in CKD patients uh, at large, only uh, in diabetic kidney disease. And you can see here uh, the indirect effects related to improving the blood pressure control, improving left ventricular or function and improved microbiome even, which is an interesting point. And the direct effects are related to being anti-inflammatory and decreasing uh, various uh, systemic uh, inflammatory processes that are happening together uh, with uh, leading to uh, uh, intrarenal vasodilatation of the efferent after the road. So another new drug, which is uh, the GLP-1 uh, agonist, is uh, with us uh, in our armamentarium to treat our patients. Uh, I hope I haven't been um, talking uh, for a long time. And by this slide, I'd like to thank you all and waiting for your wonderful input. Thank you again, uh, uh, Mrs. and Mr. Chair uh, persons and Professor Yasser for the kind invitation. Thank you all. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, very well done, uh, uh, Professor Tarek. Uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll leave the dis discussion to be led by Dr. May. Just I want to, to highlight or, or concentrate on, on few things that you mentioned. Yes. First of all, salt uh, restriction is quite important in proteinuria. Uh, we always mention salt restriction in relation to CKD progression, autohypertension, but a lot of papers on salt restriction and, and proteinuria. Uh, especially that we 
I mean, Arabs consume a lot of salt. In a study I, I did two and a half years ago, Jordanians consume 11 grams of salt a day on average, um, out of two and a half to three grams اللي مسموح فيها بالدنيا. And as far as uh, sugar in the same study, Jordanians consume 107 grams of sugar a day. اللي مسموح فيه بالدنيا هو 17 جرام بس. So I would um, uh, just emphasize اللي حضرتك حكيته على salt restriction. As far as, as GL, GLT2 inhibitors, كل يوم عم بطلع paper. آخر واحدة أعتقد قبل ثلاث أسابيع end of March. كانت بال I think nephrology dialysis and transplantation and DT um, and um, the title can um, could SGLT2 inhibitors be a game changer in focal segmental glomerulosclerosis so هلا صرنا نعرف a lot about SGLT2 inhibitors and their effects and benefits in patients with uh, proteinuria and CKD progression, of course. Uh, الأخير, just a comment on the combination of RAS inhibitors. Those consensus in 2013-2014 that we should not, but we still in selected patients. In the uh, I do, I don't know, uh, I do combine sometimes um, um, RAS inhibitors together in selected patients, of course, with uh, uh, with uh, follow up, careful uh, follow up. Again, thank you very much. You did great as always, Doctor Etna Al Aziz. Can I just thank make a comment? Uh, excuse yes, me. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, 11 grams of salt a day. Uh, mm -hmm. That's uh, uh, you said a day for the Jordanians. I don't know when living in such hot climate as our countries, should we really be that uh, restrictive related to salt like uh, people living in Finland, for example? Has anybody answered this question? Are we, are, are we to follow the same path of salt restriction for these countries? down to up to five grams of salt a day is acceptable, not, not more than that. لأنه إحنا نفس الجدل بصير على الفيتامين دي. Yes. We did um, uh, so many studies in the past 10 years على الفيتامين دي. The uh, conclusion uh, بأنه around 75% of Jordanians have vitamin D. So we started wondering طب لا يكون الليفل عندنا مختلف عن الليفل uh, yeah. outside طب يعني بإنجلاند وبفنلاند ومش عارف إيش. ما عندهم الشمس واحنا عندنا شمس وعندنا 75% من الpopulation عندهم فيتامين دي ديفيشنسي سو شود وي جيف فيتامين دي تو اول جوردانيانز اور ايجيبشنز فور اكزامبل وي دونت نو ما يعني نفس الجدل اعتقد ثانك يو فيري امبورتنت بوينتس بروفيسور انا ما ثانك يو فيري ماتش And about the combination of uh, uh, rust blockers and AC inhibitors, yes, I do sometimes do that when in young patients and when the patient is aware of the importance of follow-up and I, good, I get, get good results for the combination. So it's not absolutely contraindicated, but you have to be uh, very meticulous in selecting the patients that you're going to use the combination for. Rayek uh, Tortor. Uh, I would rather combine uh, the RAS blocker with the MRA, particularly the new one, the phenylalanine with the least side effects. Uh, if, we are call, uh, if we are anxious about the occurrence of hyperkalemia, uh, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, it's going to be, be a very big trial this year related to this particular uh, drug. It's going to be called the confidence trial. Uh, and uh, it seems that we will be using more and more of MRAs. We haven't been actually, uh, uh, myself, I haven't been, uh, uh, apart from all of these old trials related to the use of MRAs, the spironolactone, uh, I haven't been all that enthusiastic about giving it to patients. Uh, we are seeing a lot of CKD at various 
stages and some of the patients uh, get uh, lost on the way to follow up and you would worry uh, for the occurrence of hyperkalemia. So uh, I would prefer if I'm going to combine something, I would give a small, um, a small dose of cyanide diuretic or uh, start to use uh, the MRA when it is available in our country and our region, the Finerolon, uh, and to see and to gain experience with it. So uh, when you use ACE or ARBs and you, and you don't get uh, uh, reduction, enough reduction for Noria, then yes. you are obliged to add an add-on SCLT2, for instance, away yes. from diabetes. Yes. And, then, and then you're going to add uh, 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 MRAs. Yeah. And then and you keep on adding uh, one of those drugs until um, you get the reduction you want. So you can so you look what you're doing to your patient. But I, I mean, uh, if we have all these weapons, why not add together to get, uh, 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 I mean, a better effect? Well, it, it sounds quite reasonable what you, what, uh, about what you are saying, definitely. But I'm a, I'm a type 2 diabetic patient. And I, when I start to think about how many pills I'm going to have to take a day. I'm going to take pentoxifelin, an MRA, an AGL2, and a rust blocker, <laughs> and a diuretic, plus whatever else for the dyslipidemia, right? This is really very difficult, very difficult if uh, you look at the human side and, uh, of the patient. How is he going to swallow all these medications? I understand that the, pharma uh, the pharmaceutical companies are uh, helping us a lot in putting combinations in the drugs. Now you have triple therapies, a calcium channel blocker with an ACE inhibitor, uh, together with a diuretic in one pill, which is very good. But I would still be wanting to add an SGE2 inhibitors after the wonderful results. And now with the Fidelio trial, exactly. I want to add exactly. an, exactly. an MRA. So it's, it's and, really a problem for the patient to have all these pills, but. And I'm sure uh, whatever is achievable is still beyond normal normalization. No one single study has said that the drug that has been tested or the multiple drugs were able to normalize the situation. You are just decreasing it. So is it really worth it to go that far? You have to have trials showing you these combinations and the endpoints or the results, and then you will be able to choose. Yes, it is wise to use all these drugs together or enough two or three only. Uh, that's how I see it. And just one point about the SGLT2 inhibitors and the uh, KDU guidelines that are released this March, last yes. March. And it says that you continue with the drugs till dialysis or transplantation. Yes, so I, uh, I pointed to that as well, yes, which was yes. very interesting. And maybe there you were together uh, in Jordan uh, when uh, Professor uh, Sunil Bandari from uh, the Royal College mm -hmm. mentioned this particular point. Uh, Professor Van Aymet definitely uh, remembers this and he even took a snapshot of uh, this slide that was new to me. He showed that just what you said, the AG2 inhibitors were used uh, to GFR below 20, and now you are telling us uh, mm. to dialysis. Uh, when we understand, so I, I just want to understand how this works, if they are working on the renal tube use. Exactly, oh, so we, if you have to have urine. <laughs> no, we don't have any renal tube use now with fibrosis, but it seems from the slide that I showed uh, earlier that apart from this uh, action, they have various actions uh, elsewhere in the kidney related to being yes. anti-inflammatory and mm -hmm. anti-apoptotic uh, and so forth. So maybe these benefits uh, are working when the GFR is low, so not depending about the traditional pathway that we understand. Just like metformin in the beginning was used to treat diabetes and it's improving insulin resistance and so forth. And now we understand that we can use it in this and that and that and that through different mechanisms. So like Professor Raima just mentioned, uh, every, uh, every now and then we are discovering new benefits and new pathways for these uh, new drugs that uh, I think SGL2 inhibitors 
sit aside now uh, together with rust blockers. The, the second best thing that happened since yeah. the discovery of rust mm -hmm. blockers, I, I believe so. Particularly that we are able to use them now freely. And I was discussing this a few months away uh, back with the Professor Irias. Yes. I told him after that the DAPA CKD trial, I am prescribing these drugs for CKD and don't be uh, uh, amazed or astonished when you see one of my prescriptions for an undiabetic patients. And I'm giving them freely now with a GFR that is as low as 30, but I haven't been using it for less than that yet. Okay. Excuse me, Professor May, uh, uh, Professor Tari, uh, correct me if I am wrong. I feel that the role of non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker is much underestimating in treating proteinuria. For me, I use it as a second weapon in, uh, if, if AS inhibitors or ARPs cannot be used or somewhat cause some, some problems. The second line for me will, is non-dihydropyridine non calcium channel blockers. Do you agree with me of this or can I you correct? agree totally with you and they can be used in combination as yes. well as for those patients who are not tolerant to the ACEs or ARDS or developing hyperkalemia. Yes, they do have a wonderful anti effect. I don't know why it's not that uh, famous. This, yes, With all the trials really, that showed it is effective. It is I effective. always ask myself this question. Yeah. So are you, you are using what type? Dialetiazem, for example, in yes. particular? Yes. Yes. Uh, I tell you why, maybe because uh, most of these patients are uh, uh, severely hypertensive. And these non-dihydroperidines are not that uh, potent when it comes to treating hypertension, not as potent as the older ones. Maybe that's why people are not using them that much, but definitely they have a beneficial effect when it comes to proteinuria. But if you have to choose uh, 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 CCB uh, among the dihydroperidines, I think the lercanidipine is uh, more potent because of its effect on the receptor on the on the T receptors and the others. Exactly. Exactly. But I'm not aware of if, if you compare it to the non-dihydroperidine, which is going to be more potent. Uh, I'm not aware of specific trials for this, but lercanidipine in particular, maybe I haven't showed anything, any publications related to lercanidipine, but it is working on the T uh, calcium uh, channel, which is needed for the efferent uh, uh, vasodilatory yeah. uh, dil uh, effect, which is not happening with the other CCBs working on uh, the other uh, type of calcium channel. We have Professor Ayman Rifai, Dr. Ayman, if you'd like to comment. Thank you, Professor Ma'am. I'm really enjoying, and uh, since the first moment of the lecture by Professor Tare and the fruitful mm -hmm. discussion, uh, which reflects a lot of experience from the moderators and uh, Professor Tare. Um, uh, I'm just wondering about treatment of the refractory proteinuria. Um, in spite of all these agents, whether old and new, we still have a problem of refractory proteinuria. So uh, what, what's your recommendation, Professor Tai, regarding these cases that's interactable to all these measures and all these combinations uh, are we going to for uh, medical nephrectomy or sometimes proteinuria is, is very resilient uh, in treatment actually, especially of those of glomerular lesions, uh, of course, and those interactable to treatment, especially focal segmental and membranous uh, nephropathy. So what's your recommendation for- As well as amyloid kidneys, we see- Yes, in, yeah. Uh, for amyloidosis, we, we sometimes we, we do a bilateral embolization. Exactly. To, yeah, exactly. To, 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 so uh, this is that I'm worried about the, the heavy proteinuria with the severe hypoalbuminemia and the, uh, this kind of uh, challenge. What do you I think, wouldn't... Professor Tuff? I wouldn't agree less uh, with what you said. It just reminds me of those uh, severely hypertensive patients that do not fit into uh, any uh, specific disease such as 
endocrinal form of hypertension or the rare renal vascular uh, uh, hypertension, those type of patients that are receiving six lines and still out of control. You meet those patients occasionally, of course. You have tried all what you have and still they are hypertensive. I really don't know what to do with those patients, really. And I'm always uh, so uh, feeling so bad that I can't help them more as much as those protonic patients. So may, maybe the embolizations that you have been uh, talking about, I, ha I have no experience in this uh, particular uh, modality or therapy uh, uh, at all, but I'm aware that it could be helpful in this uh, group of patients. If, if you have any experience about it, could you uh, tell us, is it, is it working? Is it helpful? Have you done it? Actually, sometimes we did it in preparation prior to transplantation. We have a oh. severe proteinuria and the patient even is preemptive with GVR around 30 and creatinine is 4 or something. So we are going to transplant this patient with heavy proteinuria and hypoalbuminemia. We go mm -hmm. for embolization or uh, even uh, nephrectomy, but this is uh, yeah. we are when we are planning to have uh, a kidney transplant. Only, uh, Only. yeah, okay. yeah. This is our experience. Okay. But it's a big you... challenge, especially post transplant with, with, with the recurrence. We uh, the cases uh, with mm -hmm. the recurrent Foucault segmental and uh, yes, uh, MBGN type two. Uh, proteinuria is heavy, hypoalbuminemia, in spite of all measures, frequent plasma exchange, rotoximab, and whatever. And so uh, we have uh, some patients with uh, proteinuria like 20 gram per day and albumin around two and uh, severe uh, edema and anasarca. And this is a big challenge actually for it these. Is, it is, it um, is. I, I don't think anybody is capable of dealing with these patients in a different way than what you have uh, been uh, mentioning. They will always be difficult for uh, all nephrologists everywhere. Uh, yes. No one is really uh, finding a specific uh, therapy for uh, such patients. There must be an underlying mechanism that is not uh, understood. Uh, why these antiprotonic drugs that are working uh, for some patients, they are not working uh, for this type of patients. Is it related to some genetic uh, uh, possible disease, just like the polymorphism of the uh, of, uh, angiotensin? Could be another uh, genetic polymorphism for other uh, things. Uh, could be, could be, because it's the same drug. It, if it affects a particular patient, another, another patient, uh, does not respond. It's just a speculation. I may be right. I may be wrong. I don't know. Okay. Professor May, we have uh, some questions. Yes, please. On would, you, would you go ahead and answer with the questions, please? Okay. Uh, from uh, Professor Manali Deeb. Uh, welcome, Professor Manal. Uh, asking about uh, uh, G normal GFR level, which limits the use of thiazide like diuretics. What is the GFR level, which limits the use of thiazide like diuretics? Professor Tara, would you like to answer that? No, go ahead, Dr. May. Go ahead, Professor May. Uh, I think it, it used to be 30, but then uh, yes. there are other opinions that it, you can use it below that, but as add-on therapy, not just as alone. You can still use it as an add-on therapy. So uh, I don't know if anybody has uh, different views. This is what we all... Uh, I think would we'll agree. Yes. Mm -hmm. The problem is with diuretics, when you start to use them in CTD patients, you don't get the diuretic response you expect. That's why you are using larger, bigger doses than uh, you would be using to treat uh, uh, edema uh, elsewhere. And we are all, uh, all aware of this uh, point and we are giving uh, large doses of uh, loop diuretics. I don't know much about thiazide diuretics in this regard, but uh, when we are treating a patient with terrible edema, I guess all of us are using large doses. We used to worry about uh, the autotoxicity, which I didn't come across over more than 40 years 
of practice uh, except once. And I wasn't really sure it was related to Fusimide or not. Uh, otherwise, with Saizide, I'm not so sure the Professor Manal particular GFR to be. Uh, uh, we have uh, Rul Osman. She's saying that uh, metalazone can be used with the less GFR. Yes, this is true. Yeah, it's yeah. good. Mm -hmm. I think the problem that we cannot use. Uh, it's always combined with other uh, drugs. We don't have. Uh, specific uh, thiazide tablet that we can uh, control the GFR for its use. We usually use uh, in combination with other drugs that are controlled also by GFR. Mm -hmm. mm. And also when you use different diuretics that work at different sites, yes. you, you add on the benefit of the use yes. of diuretics. So. Uh, uh, some, from... some, uh, related to diuretics, something that uh, uh, some of us may miss is the short duration of action of diuretics. So if you want to really get a good response, you should give it over the, all the 24 hours, uh, whether in tablet form over six hours or intravenously, uh, both methods have been shown to be more or less uh, equal uh, in response, but not to give, let's say, uh, uh, 500 milligrams of frusimide uh, once a day, and expect to get the best response, but rather better to divide uh, the dose. And combination, like uh, I think yes or yourself just mentioned is good because uh, these diuretics are working at different uh, levels of the, the renal tubules. Some are working at the level of the distal convoluted tubules, others working uh, further up. So combining these diuretics together uh, has proven also to be very effective particularly in those patients with uh, advancing stages of uh, CKD. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, went through this question of uh, our um, uh, coordinator today about the combination, Rami Abu Bakr, about the combination of uh, ACE and ARBs. And we have discussed this point early yeah. from uh, Rahman Mabrouk Sheikh. Which type among ACE inhibitors and ARBs are the most potent regarding antiproteinuric effect? Would you, please, would you please mute your mic? Okay. He's asking about which is of the ACE inhibitors or ARPs is the most potent in combating proteinuria. If there is. I think the last year nice guidelines uh, and they said use the cheapest. They do not prefer la ACE or ARB. Ma fi wahed fi hum ahsan min al tani. Istamil al arxas. Fa ma yani bkul al data li talat conflicting. Yani ma fiha ay dalil ala inno al ARBs ahsan or al ACE ahsan. Kull hum zay baad. Yeah. He is asking also about your experience regarding which which type of. Investigations to use in uh, quantification of proteinuria, ACR, PCR, uh, PCR, or 24 hour urine proteins. I think the difference between them is 5%. All of them, not more than 5%. So, whatever you like, use them. All of them, we use protein creatinine ratio or albumin creatinine ratio. And we rarely use 24 hour urine collection. We have no study. ما بعرف uh, الدكتور طارق yeah, uh, uh, مش مش عملي but I would regard it still as the gold standard uh, urinary album creatinine ratio also is uh, what we depend upon we have to just realize the important facts if a patient is dehydrated you would expect the protein to be uh, more if he has been exercising uh, these facts are very important the timing of the sample is another important point Yet the recommendations are now to use it is, is much more easier, of course. And uh, the fallacies that have been described with the 24 hour are far, more, far much more than one could imagine. And you could really affect the results. So I would stick to using the renal album creatine ratio, just like Professor Velay uh, mentioned. Uh, yeah. Professor Amr. Professor Amr, okay, Dr. Amr is uh, raising his hand, but Professor Faisal Shaheen wants to comment and okay. he's unmuted. 
اهلا دكتور فيصل دي حضرتك اهلا اهلا دكتور امي اهلا يا فيصل كيفك؟ اي 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 انجويد ذا توك اوف بروف طارق از يوجوال از ثانك يو ثانك يو And he like me for me, also like me. So oh, yeah. I like it, and I take it. <laughs> He's in love with me. For me. Yes, he loves me. So uh, actually, there is all what you said is excellent because this is a new in nephrology. We don't have tools before to treat proteinuria. We don't have tools to to deal with the cardiorenal. We we don't have tools with diabetic. Now we start to have something to play with it and to work with it. Uh, I enjoy uh, all the talk, and it is really excellent and a very informative talk. And this is the new in, in, in nephrology. Thank you very much. Thank you for choosing the talk and choosing the speaker as well. Thank you for being with us and for your comments. Thank you so much. Thank you. Professor uh, Amr Husseini from the, the States. The yeah, young. thank you. So. <laughs> Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you so much for the excellent presentation, Professor Urbaz, as usual, a very nice presentation. I just have a simple question that yeah. I like and a little bit complicated question that I don't like. So the simple question, um, um, did you came across any studies that evaluated the impact of weight reduction, either with non-pharmacological or pharmacological, intervention or even surgical intervention on proteinuria uh, in CKD patients, uh, because I hate just to add medicine on top of medicine. Now we are talking about, you know, putting, adding this SGLT2 inhibitors and adding mineral corticoid inhibitors and in, in, in drinking water for everybody, right? They are expensive medication as we know, and they are yeah. not free of side effects. So I like to see the impact of non-pharmacological intervention, especially you know exercise weight reduction, and uh, uh, watching you know the carbohydrate intake, whatever. Then the pharmacological and surgical approaches for weight reduction. That's number uh, the question number one. The other question I don't know if um, uh, also you came across any uh, impact of endothelin uh, receptor blockade, especially yeah, the sure. newer one, the selective. Sure. The cell and A receptor antagonist on uh, protonaria. And thank you so much. Thank you. I'll start by, by the second uh, question, which is the ET1 uh, uh, the endothelin related uh, drugs. Um, I haven't came across this recent trial that you uh, have uh, been mentioning, but the old trials are all at experimental levels. And as a matter of fact, the endothelin blockers that I read about all of them showed uh, some unwanted uh, <clears throat> adverse events such as uh, water retention and so forth. And they are not really uh, having uh, all that uh, much of benefit uh, compared to the drugs that I have addressed today. Maybe the new one that you are talking about, which I haven't came across, maybe has uh, avoided these uh, adverse events. Regarding to your first question, which is you say it's the easy one, for me, I find that it is the difficult one. <laughs> I, I have no idea. All I know that uh, eating a healthy diet and living a healthy uh, lifestyle and eating less and exercising is good. It's good for the human being, good for the general health, maybe good for proteinuria, good for the eyesight, good for everything. I haven't came across any trials, as a matter of fact, related to the effect of exercise on proteinuria. But what I understand is exercise does increase proteinuria. Uh, does it increase it in a pathological fashion or just a transitory state? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I really don't know about uh, dieting. And I wouldn't advise patients with proteinuria and good kidney functions to start a low protein diet, for example. Uh, no, uh, nothing in the literature uh, mentioned this particular point. But, but we, we, could, we can see from, but this is only an opinion because those patients who went through this uh, uh, surgery, surgeries to reduce the weight, they did have reduction in the proteinuria and, yeah. and they had no uh, any more hypertension and even diabetes just faded away. 
we, we could see that in, in regular life, but I'm not aware of a study in, in the, on that. Could there, this there are, be there related be, but, to mm. hyperfiltration associated yes, with yes, obesity exactly, that exactly. could lead to FSGS mm -hmm. at certain mm -hmm. point in some patients with morbid obesity? Uh, right. It's a good point, Professor Amr. Uh, it's worth a very good into. point. Yeah, yeah. It's worth okay. looking into. Mm -hmm. Thank you, professors. Uh, the chat is asking mainly also mainly about the, your experiences, uh, clinical experiences from Rami Abu Bakr. Uh, SLG22 in GFR below 25 milliliter per minute, and the, the diuretic effect. If there is any concern about the diuretic effect of SLG22, especially in non-controlled diabetic patients. Something is it something I should worry about before prescribing this groups of patients? We shouldn't either. Samahli. Awalan ala al SGLT2 and GFR below 25. We don't start SGLT2 inhibitors below 25. But if the patient already ali and the normal progression of CKD nizel GFR la below 25, we keep it. Zay ma tafana. Inno there are uh, data am tatla bi inno can be used until uh, dialysis. So we continue on SGLT2 inhibitors. إذا نزل الـ GFR below 25 بس we don't start uh, على الـ diuretics um, effect we should not um, uh, bother ourselves لأنه معروف إنه الـ GFR بنزل بـ in the first um, two weeks and then it, it picked up uh, فما في أي مشكلة على الـ diuretic effect of SGLT2 inhibitors uh, Professor Manali Dib is against the use of CCP in proteinuria when ACE inhibitor is contraindicated. Uh, she said that from her experience, it is not so effective. This is a comment from Professor it's, Manali It's Dib. not as effective, but it Maybe will me. have some effect. <laughs> Definitely, it's not as effective. Yeah, it's not as effective. Yani, كل الداتا اللي طلعت على ال CCPs بإنه they reduce proteinuria something between eight and seventeen percent. So ما بنحكي عن 35 و 40% زي ما بنحكي عن راس انيبيتورز بس اذا كانت ذا اونلي تول يس وي يوز ات يعني حتى 10% از از اوكي يا بيتر ذان ناثينج ا اوكي انا في لي سؤال اخير ما بعرف للدكتور طارق او للدكتوره مي او للكل so um, uh, do we treat proteinuria in an otherwise uh, healthy and asymptomatic patient? Marid, ma'antoush wala ishi? Not diabetic, not hypertensive, mish obese, wala ando cholesterol, wala ando ishi? U tali ando proteinuria? Taman hai kanat il conclusions mil enhanced three, if you remember, tali 5.6% of healthy Americans, they do have proteinuria. فكان عليها صراع كبير بأمريكا على إنه should we treat ولا لا واحد سلم بجنن ما عندهش لا سكر ولا ضغط ولا كوليسترول ولا عنده أي إشي do we treat دكتورة مي دكتور طارق uh, uh, how uh, big is the proteinuria is it say something more, more يعني كلنا أعتقد كلنا بنتفق على انه ليس دان 1 جرام غالبا وي دونت تريت سبوز انه 2 جرام مثلا 2 جرام 2 جرام مور اب تو 2 جرام يا فما بعرف اي ثينك اي ثينك وي مونيتور ذا بيشنت اند اف وي فايند اوت ذات ات از رايزنج ذا ترند از ذات ات از رايزنج اي ثينك وي كان اد سمثينج لايك ام ار ايز فور انستانس and I think this is a, a, the practice even in uh, membranous, benign membranous with heavier proteinuria levels than this. So it is wise to just monitor and keep eye on the patient in this case. Uh, I, I have to, I have to um, try to uh, find the cause. It's impossible to have a proteinuria without a cause. And if this proteinuria is albuminuria, then we are faced with glomerular injury. So there is a sepient or un, a hidden uh, glomerular disease. Uh, I understand that there are cases of what we call isolated proteinuria that are not associated with an active urinary sediment. And this isolated form of proteinuria 
is again related to podocytopathy. So there has to be a disease behind uh, this proteinuria. I, I can't understand that even if he is a seemingly healthy person, uh, I, I look as healthy person as a person that has not, does not have protein in urine. Once he has protein in urine uh, above uh, 300 milligrams, uh, uh, 30 milligrams, he has what we used to call microalbuminuria. There is a cause for that. Is he hypertensive? Is he having an ischemic heart disease? Where did this proteinuria come from? Why is it happening? هذول they were they were investigated fully وما كان ما قدروا يوصلوا لسبب يعني lately بس ال ASN if you remember بجوز الكل بتذكر إنه they agreed that we should treat يعني أنا بحكي عن personal experience بس هو ب بأمريكا كان الاتفاق على إنه we should treat اللي وقفوا بوجههم هم شركات التأمين لأنه 5.6 percent تحكي عن 30 مليون شركات تأمين بدهم تدفعوا لهم يدفعوا لهم فلوس تكلفة علاج for life so مم. بس كان الكونسنسس بأمريكا إنه إنه we should treat حتى we لو should treat. totally healthy uh, uh, persons it, it's really it's something that we we meet yes this kind of person with proteinuria not very heavy proteinuria but you cannot find the reason for and you investigate it you don't find the reason yes Right. I would actually treat because I understand that, that proteinuria is quite injurious to the kidney and, right. leads, to pro, and leads to injury. So right. it is common sense to treat this proteinuria, even if I cannot find the cause. And I, I'm doing just what Professor May uh, uh, just mentioned. I came across a few patients during my career, not so many, that I exhausted myself to try to find the cause. And I didn't like to biopsy patients, such patients. I didn't find strong indications to do that. And it ended up by giving them an ACE inhibitors. And two of the five patients that I have seen after a couple of years with ACE therapy, they had uh, this total disappearance of their uh, album, which was in the levels of microalbuminuria uh, mm -hmm. in the beginning. Uh, Professor Said Khamis wants to comment. He is waiting for us a long time. Professor <laughs> 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 Thank you, Professor Tarek, for this elegant and comprehensive presentation, as usual. Thank you, uh, my friend. Uh, one question, if you allow me, uh, regarding mm. the... It seems to be a delicate question, but it is a challenging and never-ending debate about this issue. If you have a patient with proteinuria and the progressive CKD, and I mean progressive decline of uh, kidney function, and they reach the stage of uh, 3B or uh, 4, and still he's on ACE or ARBs or whatever, uh, would you prefer to stop ACE or ARBs at this moment or not? So, and, and the question in another way, uh, when we stop, we should stop this ACE or ARBs uh, when there is a rapid decline or progressive decline of uh, GFR? Thank you so much. Well, if I'm going to answer this uh, very nice question, uh, Professor Saeed, I, I know how disappointing this type of patient is, the one that we are doing everything for, and still he is uh, progressing. And you are asking a clear question, should I stop uh, the ACE uh, or the RAS blockade uh, at this uh, point of therapy or not? Then I have to ask myself, uh, is there a specific situation that implies that I have to stop the, the RAS or just assuming that it's not doing much, uh, then I better stop it. Uh, I'm afraid to say in such a patient, maybe this uh, progression could be even more if you stop the RAS without a strong indication. So yes, he's progressing, but maybe this progressing can be even worse if he's yeah. not under the influence of the RAS 
blockers, except if there is a compelling indication to stop it. So uh, even or if the results are disappointing with, with treating such a patient that we meet uh, not uncommonly, I wouldn't stop the RAS blockers, Dr. Said, as long as uh, there's no compelling indication. If someone else has a large suggestion. Especially on, uh, in, in diabetic patients. I excuse to stop in diabetic patients, uh, hyperkalemia, for Otherwise, yes. uh, not at all. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the answers. Yes, I, I do believe that. And if you stop it, uh, the keratinine will go down a little bit, then it will come up higher than sure. it used to be. Right. Uh, maybe, maybe I stop it only when I decide that this patient is for dialysis. So yeah. we, we, we stop it then, but otherwise, no. Okay, thank you. Except if you are going to continue using the RAS blocker to treat hypertension, because it's the best drug right. to give to a right. patient on dialysis. Right. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. There are no more questions from the audience بدي اشارك الدكتور طارق حماسه للميتفورمين يا يا شهر شهر ونص طلع بيبر جميله على انه ات ريديوسز مورتاليتي باي 31% ان بيشنتس وذ ديابيتس اند هايبرليبيديميا سبيشالي اون ستاتنز وندرفول واحد وثلاثين بالمية ريدكشن بعد هالو على طول بعد هالو النبي الله بعد هالو ثيرتي وان ريد ثيرسنت ريدكشن إن مورتاليتي وتش أنا هو ما أخذ الورسين بتوعي دلوقتي أعتقد إنه الميتفورمين لازم يصير ينحط بمية الشرب عنا يعني لازم كل الناس يأخذوا ميتفورمين بل كن نزل وزن كمان شوي بعد ال القطايف ومش عارف إيش ورمضان أو يا if you allow me, I, 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 uh, thank you, Professor Anamat, for raising this issue of Professor Tari of metformin. And sometimes we call it the great metformin. I see the pathologist and they have some metformin al azim And now I'm supervised um, uh, an MD thesis about the uh, use of combination between metformin and uh, SGL2 inhibitors in two arms, uh, diabetic and non-diabetic kidney disease. And I think with, with, with the use of metformin with the, uh, even with the uh, GFR uh, up to, uh, as you know, that metformin now, it's, it's permissible to be uh, given with the, with the declining uh, or, uh, or CKD uh, three or five or four, uh, and the uh, the fear of lactic acidosis, uh, I think, is uh, regressing now, and we can use it uh, more liberally in, in such patients. So I believe that we can we can benefit from the combination of SGL two and metformin even in uh, non-diabetic uh, kidney diseases. So uh, I'm totally supporting the use uh, of uh, metformin. I share you the, these uh, feelings. Thank you. Uh, has anyone been using it lately um, in the management, early management of uh, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease after the various trials in this regard? Quite good number of patients. I think it's 60 65 patients machine Ali, and they're doing great. Hey, uh, yes, uh, and, and it's uh, it's better to have a control group in such patients, Doctor. When I met to 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 see that, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. What's the case without the metformin? So uh, I think in such uh, trials, we should have a, a control R. Without Already it. trials have been published in this regard by mm. this uh, right. uh, design. But, but uh, it's and, encouraging, uh, of course. Yeah, yeah. If you look, Professor, 
We, we have two more questions in the chat. We have two more questions in the chat asking and about- And Professor Ali Ta is raising his hand. Yes, me. yes, yes. And Professor Tariq Tantawi also is waiting us. Okay. Uh, asking about uh, the, uh, your experience in uh, using uh, potassium exchange resins when combining ACE and ARPs. And the second or the last question about the use of uh, ARPs in single kidney. Using yeah. uh, uh, calcium, uh, uh, potassium, potassium. Uh, change resin uh, is definitely needed. And with the new formulation that would be available in our Egyptian market uh, soon, it would expand uh, our use of MRAs and angiotensin receptor blockers, even uh, in later stages of CKD when we are facing hyperkalemia. Yet, yet, as always, there will be still a burden on top of the head of the patient who's going to have to swallow all this, particularly the newcomer is not a cheap uh, medication mm -hmm. forward. Yeah. Although less gastrointestinal effects as you would all know, but uh, the theory behind combining uh, exchange resin with whatever drug is causing hyperkalemia is quite valid because you need the benefits of the drug that's causing the hyperkalemia whether rust blocker or an MRA uh, right. antagonist. Uh, and there was you another use a, question. Uh, single uh, the use of uh, treatment of proteinuria and uh, starting middle is or ERPs in single kidney. Yeah, definitely we use it. Uh, we, yeah. After transplant, yeah. We, yeah. we do use it. So solitary kidney, the so kidney sure. transplant, yeah, the cool recommendations in the world. It's, it's a safe drug, ما في أي مشكلة. بده sure. شوية monitor بجوز اللي طلع عليه بأنه you start today بعد 10 to 14 days you ask your patient to, to do kidney function and GFR if there is a 25% rise in his creatinine then let's continue. Otherwise, that's it. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ali Taha, Professor Ali Taha, please. Rahman Rahim, Assalamu Alaikum. طبعاً. ده بهذا المحتفل العلم الحقيقة أستاذنا دكتور طارق الباز دكتور نيمة دكتور ميد دكتور ياسر هم حقيقة يعني البوتنوية أخذت حقها وزيادة ولكن معلش في سؤال دكتور طارق البيشنت الأنيوبولا وهيمو دياليسيز وستيل هاف أيون أوتبوت أند ماس في بوتنوية وز ماركد هايبو ألبومونيميا what is the best uh, treatment for this, this patient? Uh, we face some patient. Uh, there is an, not, not many patient, but like in some patient on hemodialysis, which is marked edematous and still botanic and still hypoalbuminemic. What is the best solution about, about uh, all drugs that can be used, these drugs, a list of drugs you mentioned, or we can uh, use specific drugs for those patients? For this particular patient, there hasn't been uh, described any uh, specific drug. Uh, there isn't a specific drug, so you would treat proteinuria as you would treat elsewhere. Uh, mind you, uh, using the RAS uh, blockers uh, could still be uh, of value in such a patient. Uh, this is rather a difficult uh, case scenario, just like those difficult to treat hypertensive patients and proteinuric patients uh, due to uh, uh, other uh, glomerular lesions. They are quite challenging and quite difficult. I wouldn't have any alternatives to do apart from what you are doing, uh, trying to correct the hemodynamic status of this patient and the associated hypo and the anemia, if it exists. When I know that if you infuse album, it's going to go down again, uh, they do have proteinuria, as you mentioned, yes. Uh, then uh, you may like to resort to surgery, just like Professor uh, Rafai, Ayman Rafai. Or, or maybe medical, medical nephrectomy. Yeah, or medical, medical, medical nephrectomy, yes. I guess yeah. this would be easier yeah. to say. Embolization or. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are the candidates for medical nephrectomy. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. You can yes. also try non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs first. Endomethazine, we are never, uh, we, we, we're not using it anymore yet. It is a very potent uh, anti drug as well. And 
maybe we can use it. In but this with the ex- medical nephrectomy, you can you can avoid the surgery. Of course, right. of course, right. of course. Thank you, Dr. Tal. Thank you, Dr. Ali, raising a very important uh, issue, not mm-hmm. common, but it is there. Thank you. I, Professor Said Hamis wants to comment again. Uh, one last statement, Professor Tarek, by the way, if you look at most of these drugs, the antiprotonaric drugs, and by the way of uh, mentioning metformin, uh, I think most of these drugs was inf- uh, were invented initially for this, not for this purpose already. And this is what's called drug repurposing. And I'm now preparing uh, one presentation regarding uh, drug repurposing in nephrology. I mean, in protonoric or non-protonoric patients. Good, I think it's uh, very important to domain this, this issue. This is the repurposing, uh, repositioning of drugs after uh, better understanding of various mechanisms related to this drug. They have re- been repositioned as you uh, uh, mentioned. And we'll be looking forward to this interesting talk that you are talking about, about uh, the new uh, views about the old drugs. Thank you, my dear prof. Thank you. Thank Dr. Khaled Abuzaid is asking about the recommended dose of pentoxifelin. Recommended dose of pentoxifelin in one trial, uh, Dr. Khaled, uh, 400 milligrams, only 400 milligrams were tried. In another mega trial, bigger trial, uh, 1,200 milligrams were tried. And now we are waiting for this new trial that would uh, be started uh, this year that I told you about is going to take about nine years. Uh, I'm not uh, that sure of the, the particular dose. It wasn't mentioned when I read uh, about this trial, but these are the doses that have been described so far in uh, some of the trials that came across 400 and 1,200. I think the bigger dose is a bit too much. If you are getting a response with the 400 milligrams, this is good and well and good. Okay. Is anybody have- using it, by the way? Is anybody using it to treat our proteinuric patients? I think no. No, Why? no I haven't. Yet. Why? Why? I, I don't know. No. <laughs> yes. You, we will use uh, after that. <laughs> I think we better start to use it. Yes. yes. Ah. Uh, Dr. Khaled Awazid wants to comment uh, by himself? Yeah, sure. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, Dr. Khaled. Dr. Tawari Zahad. Really, I'm, I'm asking about pentoxifelin dose because uh, most of my patients I try to use pentoxifelin with them is coming uh, have a lot of side effects, even really? with low dose uh, 400. I don't know why, really. Most of them is coming by dizziness, drowsiness, to stop their medication spontaneously because of the side effects. That's why I'm still asking about which is the best dose to be used in those population. Right. I don't have a straightforward answer except to what is present in the trials, and I just uh, mentioned it. Uh, and that, and that, and that, and that, SR 400 milligrams, Yes, for hundred. Yeah, but, but really, but really, Dr. most of them are coming, have the same complaint, stop the medication spontaneously uh, by their own. They didn't continue, they didn't complete even the course for one month because of the side effects. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, most of them I used maybe since about one year, I started to use uh, pentoxifelin in protonoric population, especially in diabetics. But I don't know why they have, uh, most of them have the same side effect. Uh, and I have a comment. Yeah. I have a comment as regards the combination of metformin and this gelatin inhibitor. Uh, really, it's a very you know, powerful and very fantastic medication to be used uh, even for uh, cardioprotective, renoprotective, antiprotonaric, a lot of uh, benefits. But uh, I think we have to always recommend our patient especially in case of sepsis and the dehydration, to stop this medication spontaneously, to avoid mala uh, uh, metformin associated lactic acidosis and the eoglycemic ketoacidosis associated with those combinations. It is fatal because actually I have four cases reported this year. I use this combination and they presented to ICU in a critical situation because of 
metformin associated lactic acidosis and the euglycemic ketoacidosis. And actually, they take a long time to be recovered from this complication. That's why I ha we have to recommend to be in a tail of any recommendation as regards this combination for any patient, especially in sepsis and dehydration. And I add to uh, what you say regarding individualized therapy, uh, patients with uh, HFREF advanced uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, these type of patients, septic patients, of course, uh, we don't see lactic acidosis, but you, if you are going to give metformin to such types of patients that you have mentioned, you are inviting uh, lactic acidosis definitely in such patients. And again, uh, the agile 2 inhibitors, I would be cautious when prescribing it to an, an elderly patient who has an enlarged prostate, who has a problem related to motility, who has a problem in drinking water. It, is, it isn't the best of drug to give to such a patient. So again, individualization of therapy is a cornerstone when selecting therapies, not just because the drug is effective, I can give it to uh, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. دكتور طارق طنطاوي. السلام uh, عليكم uh, كل سنه وانتم طيبين. Uh, really I enjoyed uh, the, the elegant and wonderful presentation by Professor Baz and uh, mm -hmm. I enjoyed also by the, the, the moderations from Professor Ghanimad, Professor Maya Hasaballah and uh, the well uh, performed discussions. Uh, during uh, the usage of our anti proteinuric alimentarium, we have to put in mind the adverse effect of our drugs. Uh, as regard uh, ACE or ARBs, uh, hyperkalemia and declining of GFR more than 30%, as regard non dihydropyridine uh, also can cause uh, uh, constipations. Yes. Uh, 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 also, when we use it, this combination with bottom mind do not alter the intraglomerular hemodynamics too much because, as you mentioned, Professor Baz, uh, the, 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 the ACE or ARBs. Uh, concerning about uh, different arterial vasodilatation and as regards grade two inhibitors or concerned with the afferent reconstruction, not constriction of the afferent arterial, but to normalize it. Uh, so when we combine these drugs plus uh, 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 overzealous diuretics, we may alter the intraglomerular uh, pressure and um, in a matter that it will alter the renal functions. Uh, for that purposes, we have to use it uh, these drugs in a judge's dosage to have the, the perfect or the, the, the target what we have. As regards the question for Professor Ali Taha, I think so that renal amyloidosis is a part that uh, causes indecisional disease plus severe proteinuria and the hypoalbuminemia. And in that situation, uh, 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 Professor Ali Taha, uh, we have to look for the, what is the reason for this issue that the yeah. patient is malnourished uh, severe hypoalbuminemic uh, antiprotonemic, and as bad he uh, reaches the, the issue of hemodialysis. And I think we have in this situation a multidisciplinary team with the hematologist, or the, uh, as we, Professor uh, Ayman Rifa, Professor Maya Hasaballah, Professor Waramat mentioned that medical or surgical nephrectomy. At the end, many thanks. And the 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 discussion with you. Many thanks. Thank you. Shukran. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, no more. No more questions. Okay. No more questions and more uh, comments. And excuse me to ask uh, the last question, Professor Tari. Uh, is there a single drug from that all you have explained that you can expect in the future to be called the CKD specific drug? No. CKD specific drug, I can't, I can't say that because if, uh, if you no look one, the, no, no, SGT2 not, 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 was, uh, SLGT2, SLGT2 is not expected to be like that to be in no. the future treating targeting CKD proteinuria and definitely uh, retarding, retarding the progression and one specific for the kidney. There's still a big gap, yeah. yes, even with the use I, of SGLT2. This is the issue of my question. Yeah. Is it still early for this to, to call the, the drug, this drug for this? And to be honest, the breakthrough الوحيدة اللي so far صارت بتاريخ البروتينيوريا والكيدنيز هي الراس inhibitors. Yes. Still, the, يعني, still in the top of that. 
فتنزل تطلب بلف كثير ايرلي انه نحكي على الاس جي ال تي 2 انهبيتورز مع انهم فيري بروميسنج دراجز بس البريك ثرو كانت الراس انهبيتورز بدون جي 20 years of trials directed to this particular point with the RAS blockers. Uh, we just have to wait for some time for the SGL2 in the same uh, in the okay. same regard. But I still say it's the second best thing that happened uh, after RAS blockers. In, it's the SGL2. Yeah, the SGL2, <laughs> second yes. best thing. Yes. Okay. Professor Mai, Professor Gunaimat, we have no more questions and no more comments. Thank you. And I, I thank you all. I really enjoyed the night tonight. Yes, very much. And nice. I'd like to thank you all, the Professor Gunaimat, Professor Tore, thank and you. all the attendees, really. Uh, يعني بجد, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. شكرا جزيلا للجميع شكرا دكتور طارق استمتعنا ب ب ب محاضرتك وبالدسكشن كالعادة. وكل عام وانتم بالف خير ربنا يعيدوا عليك وعلى مصر بالصحه والسلام ان شاء الله تعالى فيصل نايس سيينج يو كل عام وانتم بالف خير حبيبي ابو محمد ثانك يو اول ثانك يو بروفيسور طارق الباز فور ذيس هاي ليلكت ليكشر ثانك يو بروفيسور ماي بروفيسور غنيمات فور مودريتنج ذيس فيري 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 فروتفول ديسكشن Thank you uh, all professors who attended and shared in the discussion. Professor Ayman Rifai, Saeed Khamis, Ali Taha, Tariq Tantawi. Uh, thank you for all attendees who shared and uh, enriched this discussion with their continuous and continuous questions. And excuse me to close this very rich night and last one in Ramadan. Uh, and uh, hope to meet you in Bad uh, Eid, inshallah, our first meeting, which will be in. 11 May by May, and I will announce later on after Eid and hope you a very nice vacation and for, for Eid and last 10 days of Ramadan. Uh, thank you. Thank you.